we're in uh, John chapter 19. We have spent uh, several weeks going through the trials of our Lord, the Jewish portion of the trial in three phases and the Roman portion of the trial in three phases. Uh, it is um, perhaps, and in fact not even perhaps, it is the greatest injustice ever perpetrated in the history of man leading to the greatest crime ever committed by man. <clears throat> there is no legitimate charge against him. There's been no crime committed. And during the Roman uh, section of the trial, at every phase, he's determined to be innocent. And yet, uh, he is about to be delivered over uh, to his um, execution. We spent some time talking about this man, Pilate, and the effort that he has made to try to rid himself of this problem of Jesus. He does not fully understand what the Jewish leaders are doing, but he knows he's being manipulated. He knows the man is innocent, and he cannot um, figure out a way to escape because he is, in a sense, under their control. They know that he only holds his office if he maintains peace and order in the region. He knows he has to maintain peace and order in the region in order to keep his job. And the Jewish leaders know that they can stir up a rebellion at almost any time. So given that, they have him literally under uh, their thumb. And the pressure of keeping his job is going to bring... Pilate to the point of handing over Christ uh, to be crucified. But I want to take you to uh, one other section before we get to the crucifixion itself. In Matthew chapter 27, Matthew recording these last few words of Pilate. Matthew 27. And verse uh, uh, 22. You know, Pilate uh, said a couple of exceedingly uh, profound things in his time with the Lord, one of which we've already spent uh, a, a fair amount of time discussing, and that was this question he raised or the statement that he made, what is true? What is true? And because of that, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about truth and the world's view of truth. In this section of Scripture, he says something else that's exceedingly profound. In verse 22, Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? What shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? That really is a question for the ages. There is no more important question than that. What shall I do with this Jesus who is called Christ? There are really only two answers to that question. You either stand with his accusers or you bow in submission as his subject. The world, as Pilate, tries to avoid the question. And they have a lot of different ways of doing that. But they, they boil down to essentially two. Uh, they, they try to ignore him. They try to pretend he does not exist. He is not real. Or they try to change him. That is, they try to change God. They try to make God in their own image to fit what they believe God should be. One is atheism and agnosticism or whatever you would call it. The other is religion. But both, both stand with Christ's accusers. Because Jesus says, if you are not with me, you are 
against me. So he does not allow men and women to avoid of this issue. They must choose. Even if they are ambivalent, even if they simply try to pretend he does not exist, it does not matter in the sight of God. They must choose. They must choose. And Pilate did. And he chose incorrectly. Herod chose incorrectly. The crowd chose incorrectly. The soldiers chose incorrectly. They passed judgment on the perfect Son of God who is the judge. Who is the judge? Every one of those people, and people all down through history, who have come and gone, every one of them know today they chose wrongly. They chose wrongly. So I think the lesson that I'd like to bring before we enter into the next section is this. It is really important that you choose correctly. And it's important that you not be wrong, that you not make any mistake. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, to test yourself to see if you're in the faith. Be sure. And then warn people. We must warn them. We must tell them of the consequences of choosing wrongly. Do not judge Christ wrongly because he will judge you rightly. And the only escape from his righteous justice and wrath is the payment that he made on the cross that we're about to look at. Unless you accept that work and you accept him, you will stand before him in judgment. What shall I do with Jesus called the Christ? Bow. <laughs> Submit. Believe. Receive. Adore, worship, follow. The cry of the crowd. Let him be crucified. Let him be crucified. It's not surprising because they really represent mankind. You know, mankind um, hates God. Now, if you went around and took a survey, they would never admit that they hated God. That is not what they would say. But they do, because Jesus said, they hate me, and therefore they will hate you. And why do they hate God? Well, because he's God, and because he's holy, and because man wants to be God, just as Satan does. And man is under the sway of Satan and under the control of his sin. And so he is a rebel. He does not want anyone to tell him what to do. He does not want to bow. And when presented with Christ, God in human flesh, he does what all men would do and what they would do today. He kills them. He kills him because man loves his sin and God is holy and just. So, we are about to witness in this section one of the 
greatest tragedies in human history, the greatest crime ever perpetrated, man executes God. Now, God never goes out of existence. I don't want to theologically get you confused here, but the man Jesus is about uh, to be killed, uh, crucified. And yet, while we are to witness this crime, this ultimate evil, this manifestation of the depravity of man to its extreme, we at the same time witness the goodness of God. For God takes this evil event and turns it into that which is the greatest good. It is an event that will bring ultimate glory to himself, and it is an event that will make a way for sinners like you and I to be forgiven and to be ushered into the presence of God. It's always been the plan. It's always been the plan. God has had this plan from eternity past. And he reveals it throughout his scripture, throughout the Old Testament. He reveals it in prophecies. And we've talked about these before, prophecies that are either verbally predicted, that are, that are specifically words in the Old Testament that describe these events, this person, what's going to happen. Or they are typically predicted, that they are pictures of this event and the things that are going uh, to happen. But there are hundreds and hundreds of prophecies because God wants us to know, he wants us to be absolutely sure of this, that this is his plan. It is for his glory. It is for your salvation who come, and he is in control. He is sovereign. And no evil of man will stop his amazing, redemptive plan. It started in Genesis 3.15. Remember? Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman. Yeah, right at the curse. There was going to be one who would come. Satan would bruise his heel, but he would his bruise his head or destroy him. It was an illusion. It was a veiled prophecy of the coming Messiah to bring victory over Satan and of sin. He would be the seed of the woman. He would be the virgin born one. In Isaiah 53, go with me for a minute to Isaiah 53. One of the great sections of Scripture on God's plan of redemption and his Messiah who would come. Isaiah 53 and verse 10, it says, And it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when you made his soul an offering for sin. Isaiah said, there's one who's coming. There's one who's coming will be for the purpose of paying, atoning for sin. And it will be God who brings him to this place. Because Isaiah 53, 7 said, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers. He is the Lamb of God. He is the sacrificial Lamb. He is the perfect one, the one whose death can atone for our sins. The prophecies are numerous and detailed, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on them. However, as we begin to read this section of Scripture, we will see those prophecies over and over again, because once again, God wants us to know that Jesus is not a victim. He is not a victim. This is the plan of God, and it's all happening just 
as he ordained. So with that, let's go to John 19. John 19, beginning in verse 15. And they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. And so he delivered him to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and they led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went out to the place called Golgotha, the place of the skull, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. And then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but he said, I am the King of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. And the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each soldier apart, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said therefore among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it. Who shall it be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Let's stop there. They took a Jesus out, to be crucified. Crucifixion is a heinous way uh, to kill someone. Developed probably by the Persians, but perfected by the Romans, it is, um, it is an agonizing form of death. It takes days. It is cruel. It is painful. In fact, it's so painful that we coined a word. The word excruciating comes from uh, crucifixion. It, uh, it causes uh, cramping, agony. The person is dehydrated on the cross, but ultimately the person dies of asphyxiation. Because while they're hanging on the cross in order to breathe, they have to push themselves up on their feet, which are nailed uh, to the cross. And eventually, they simply can't do that anymore. It is why, what we'll see in the text, when they come to try to speed his death, they break the shin bones of the two on either side of him, because without the shin bone, there is no ability to push yourself up anymore. Therefore, there is no ability to take oxygen into your lungs. And with all of that said, it was a shameful form of death. It was done in public by the side of a road. The person was stripped naked and just hung there in shame with their crime written over their head. It is a, um, it is torture. But that is the death that Jesus suffered, and it is the death that Scripture spoke of from the beginning. Um, in Numbers 21, 6 to 9, there's an interesting account of God's judgment on his people. You'll remember this account. 21, <clears throat> 6 to 9. Well, let's start in 5. And the people spoke against God and said, Moses, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. Manna. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against 
you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And then Moses, and excuse me, then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall die. Excuse me, shall live. <laughs> And so Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was. If a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. You had to place your trust in something that ultimately seemed foolish. You couldn't go to doctors. You couldn't pray. You couldn't do anything to save yourself if you were bitten by the serpent, you simply had to drag yourself into a place where you could look on the serpent. You had to do what God said. You had to humble yourself. You had to take the provision that he offered. Go with me to John, back to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Verse 14 and 15, Jesus says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In John 8, verse 28, And Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And in 12, 32, And if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. A crucifixion was pictured at the time, the children were wandering in the wilderness, and crucifixion was promised by Jesus over and over because that serpent was a picture of the crucified Christ. And just as they were helpless to solve their issue of the poison that was in them, except by gazing on that serpent, we too, as sinners, are helpless to deal with the poison of our sinful natures apart from our gazing on, accepting, looking on this one who is lifted up and bowing to him. He's. He says, and he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. He went out. That too you might miss. It is a prophecy. It is a prophecy because the sin offering in Leviticus was to be taken outside the camp after the offering was made. Jesus was to be taken outside and killed. The fact that he carried his crossbar was not unusual. That was typical. They would carry the cross of the one to be uh, crucified. And then he was crucified at a place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. There's some debate about exactly where that is. We won't get into the details of that. There are two possible locations, but that's really not the important part. The important part is that he was crucified. What I found interesting, among many things, is that there was really no detail of the actual crucifixion event or the actions. And it isn't in any of the Gospels. It's just such a simple, straightforward statement for such a profound event. Verse 18, where they crucified him with two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now, you can, you can get a better glimpse of crucifixion if you go into the Old Testament. You can get it in Psalm 22. You can, you can hear the agony from the cross. Psalm 22 is Jesus speaking from the cross. 
by the Spirit of God through the writings of David. And you, there you can listen to the mocking of the people and you can experience the, the pain and the suffering that he's going through physically. But the gospel writers don't choose uh, to do that. Someday we can ask them why. But the Spirit of God didn't lead them to do that because the issue was not the physical pain of Christ. The issue was the spiritual pain of Christ and the taking the sin of man on himself. Now, Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. Again, this was typical. The, the sign would be over the one who has been executed, and it would serve a very pragmatic purpose since this execution was public, on a, generally on a road, a lot of people would be walking by. It's a constant reminder that you should keep the rules. You should keep the rules. It was a reminder for all of the people that Rome had conquered that they were serious, they were dangerous, and if anyone is or commits a crime of insurrection or a crime against the state or a serious crime, they face this horrific punishment. This punishment was so great that it was not a punishment for a Roman citizen. It was only for those that were non-Roman citizens. But again, Roman, Roman order was dependent on the submission of the people. That was why Pilate was worried because he couldn't afford an insurrection, but one of the ways that Rome ensured people's submission was the constant use of this kind of public execution to remind people of the consequences of wrong action. The difficult problem here for, uh, for Pilate, although it wasn't a difficult problem, he decided to use this as a find a little jab against the Jewish leaders, but uh, Jesus was not convicted of any crime, and Pilate knew that. So there was no crime to put over his head. So he simply wrote um, who he was. If you take all of the different accounts, it would the, to the total of all of them that would lead you to uh, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, written in Hebrew and Latin and Greek so that everyone would understand. Isn't that ironic? Isn't that ironic? Because that's the truth. That is the truth. Now, Pilate doesn't understand it or believe it. He wrote that because he's trying to get at the Jewish leaders. This is kind of an in-your-face thing for him to do. Here is your king, this pitiful one. He's your king. That's why he's hanging on this cross. It's what you deserve. And you know they get the message because that's their response in verse 21. So don't write that. Write that he said he was the king of the Jews. Right? Pilate says, now what I've written, I have written. And then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts. To each soldier a part, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam and woven at the top. So, yeah, you know, there were four pieces of clothing. He had a, something that he wore on his head. He had a, um, a belt. He had sandals, he had an outer garment, and then he had an inner garment. The inner garment was the one that was woven without seam. Four soldiers, five pieces of clothing. Seems simple enough. So how is it that that is exactly what Psalm 22:18 says? How is that? Well, let's go there. It's, it's just... Um, well, actually, we can just read it out of verse 24. Psalm 22:18 says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Those soldiers did exactly what they wanted to do. 
They had no concept of prophecy. They had no idea why this man was executed. They were just Roman soldiers doing their job, killing this guy. And part of the booty for them was his clothing. It just happens he has five pieces of clothing, and there are only four guys. And there's one piece, therefore, that you're either going to have to destroy or figure out how to, um, to give to one or the other. And so they cast lots. Cast lots. You, um, you, you must, as you read this, through this account, uh, uh, learn um, many things. But one of the things you must know is this is the truth. <laughs> you, you cannot make this up. And that's the essence of what God is saying in these prophecies. These are not things that Jesus could plan out and make happen. These are things that were written hundreds and, in some cases, thousand years before this event. And the specificity of it, the detail of it, overwhelming. Overwhelming. Because God writes history, and God brings it about. He says it, and he is faithful to do it. And he uses the evil of men, the evil of women, and he brings it about perfectly the providence of God the providence of God this, um, the crucifixion is uh, is one of the central focuses of the Christian faith It, uh, I was telling Barbara when I, when, when I was trying to think and get my thoughts together for today. It, it's way beyond me. And it's way beyond our one hour uh, time in this class. But I can say this. Uh, this event should impact you. It should impact you all of the time. It is one of the things that we celebrate when we take communion. We celebrate the person and the work of Christ. We celebrate the person of Christ and this, his death. Because it is by his death that we are saved or can be saved. So I was thinking, I think the crucifixion should bring you to tears. I think you should weep over the reality of it, over the agony and humiliation that it cost our Savior, and over the, the truth that you caused it, and I caused it. We should weep. And I think we should be humbled. Humbled that he'd do that for us. For sinners. And I think we should be grateful. <laughs> kind of goes without saying, doesn't it? We should have been on that cross. Or we should have died in our sins to an even worse faith. But he went there for us. We should be thankful. And we should rejoice. We should rejoice. Because he did it. He accomplished it. He was victorious. He paid for sin. He defeated Satan. He defeated death. He set us free. 
And because of him and the cross, we have hope, the hope of heaven, the hope of eternity, the hope of eternal life, because we could be reconciled to God. And we should rejoice that he got to go back, to return to heaven, to fellowship with the Father, to the place of exaltation. He came in humiliation. He's returned to exaltation, and he'll return here in exaltation. And we should rejoice. And through all of that, as you reflect, I think you should be and I should be in awe of our God, of a wisdom that solves a problem that is without solution, how to bring a sinner into the presence of holiness. A love that cares enough to pay the price necessary to bring that sinner into the presence of holiness. A grace and a mercy that would grant it to that sinner who brings no merit, nothing of value. The crucifixion, well, it only has one verse here, but it means volumes to us, and we should continue to reflect on it as we worship our great triune God. Let's pray. Father, thanks uh, for our time together, Lord. Thank you for this section of Scripture. Thank you, Jesus, that you went through it. You were willing to come, suffer all that man could pour out on you in his evil, and yet always be in control and ultimately victorious. And because of that, because of that, mercy could be extended to us, Lord, we could be set free from sin's power and not have to face its penalty. So, Lord, help us to meditate on, reflect on, live in the awe and wonder of the crucifixion and the coming resurrection in everything that we say and do and think. As Paul said, I just, uh, I just want to glory in the cross. So we pray that you would, uh, that you would take our lives, Lord, and use them for your glory. In your name, we pray. Amen. <laughs>